this morning. My name's Mary, I'm the pastor of the church, and I'm so glad that uh, you're here this morning, and I welcome you visitors. I hope that God's presence will just touch your heart in a special way. That's what happens when God's family gets together, amen? It's all about grace. Grace is what comes to encourage a heart to change. before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your love for us. We thank you, God, that you call us to a place of surrender. A place of dependence, God. Dependence upon your word, dependence upon the spirit of Christ leading us, guiding us, helping us to overcome so many things, God, that seek to rob us in life. We thank you for the power outflowing the resurrection. We thank you that you make all things available to us that we need through your grace. And this morning, we grab a hold of your word and we ask for you to make it alive to us and that, Father, we would grow as your children to understand your great love. Hear our hearts this morning, God, as we press in to learn from you and from the life of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to look at the life of Jacob. Jacob has a history. You have a history? Uh-oh. He's operated in fear. He's taken care of himself and that he's been very selfish. He's tenacious. And really, Jacob represents self-effort. All of his life, he's lived up to his name. That name, Jacob, in Hebrew, means supplanter. He has been a manipulator. He's been a trickster. He's harmed others for his own gain. Know any? Jacob's? It's a spirit. Jacob uh, manipulated his father, Isaac. He manipulated his twin brother, Esau. He manipulated his father-in-law, Laban. Of course, in the midst of all of it, Jacob gets to reap a little bit of what he has sown and that God allows him to be on the other side of that trickster spirit, uh, be on the other side of that manipulator. It's interesting to me that Jacob seems to just kind of repeat his history. We can do that, can't we? You know, we know that we're heading down the wrong path, but gosh, here we go. We just... We just do it over and over and over again until we meet a turning point. Our turning point is definitely Jesus. Our story picks up where Jacob has a desire to return home after 20 years. 20 years before, Jacob had tricked his brother 
Esau, and he had gotten his birthright. He'd gotten the blessing. You know, Esau was the firstborn. He popped out just before Jacob did. And Esau was the rightful heir to double of what Isaac would leave. But Jacob wanted that, and so he tricked Isaac into giving him the blessing. If you want to read about that, you can go and start at Genesis 28 and read through that. I don't have time this morning to go there, but you ought to read the story. It's a good one. It's a good lesson for all of us. But here's Jacob, and he's decided he's going to return home, and it's 20 years down the road, and he hasn't lost track of the fact, and I believe this is Jesus always reminding us of things that we left undone. He wants to go back, but he knows that his brother Esau told him that if he'd ever see him again, he'd kill him. And he's not real eager to go home. <laughs> but God's sending him home. How many know what God sent you to do sometimes you don't want to do? Right? And here's where Jacob finds himself. He's got to go forward because that's where Esau, that country that God wants him to go, he wants him to reconcile with Esau. And Laban, his father-in-law, Jacob has been such a trickster with him that Laban's not real happy with him. But Laban's sons are even more unhappy with Jacob because he tricked them out of their inheritance too. He's a mess. Somebody say he's a mess. He is a mess. His, his intelligence and his self-effort has gotten him in a bind. Jacob's uh, going to take his family back with him, but God arranges, and I want you to hear this in the morning because I know this is true in my heart and I'll bet you will testify to it as well. God arranges for Jacob to find an alone time with him. So Jacob sends his family on ahead, across the river, into that land. There's a big story of how he prepares to kind of sweet-talk his brother. There's all of that going on. But the part I want you to focus on is that God allows Jacob to be alone. Why? Because God has in mind that it's time for grace to bring him to a turning point in his life. He cannot continue on the same way that he's been going because God had promised him that he would be a part of a great nation and we don't want to be led by its trickster, right? So Jacob's got to change. Somebody say it means change. change. It means change. <clears throat> I'm going to read from Genesis 32 today. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob answered. Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jesus, or Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? And then the man blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. <laughs> Before Jacob returned home and crossed over to, into the promised land, God met him, God crippled him, God blessed him, and he changed his name. Say, wow, that's an encounter. I want that. Mm -mm. Now, now, I don't necessarily pray that prayer, but every one of us should. It was love's turning point for Jacob. 
Jacob had spent that lifetime selfishly deceiving others, striving in his own strength. But at this point, he would wrestle with truth, and he'll be, he would begin to live the life of faith that God had created him to live from the very beginning. But you know, God knew he was going to do just exactly what he did. God is not surprised by your life, by the way. It's just that he says, will you come to a turning point at the cross? Jacob had several encounters with God, but he continued to live in his own strength rather than by faith in God before this time. It was time. You know, <laughs> John's dad used to say, hard heads have sore tails, but in this story, hard heads have sore hips. <laughs> faith is what you do between the last time you experienced God and the next time you experienced an encounter with God. And we have to learn how to live as people of faith in times that we just don't understand. You're living in a time you don't understand today? It's going to require your faith. God will be faithful to you, and he will bring grace for your needs. From our encounter this morning in our lesson, Jacob would be a new man. He'd have a different vision for his life because God had touched him. He'd be a new creation that was forged by the Lord. Jacob would have a new name, a name that meant he'd prevail with God. He would walk with God. Isaiah 62, 2 said that Jacob is given a new name by the mouth of the Lord. God wants to give us a new name. He wants to speak into our lives, in other words. A new heart. Jacob would get a new heart, a tenderer heart. All of a sudden, he would be filled with love for his brother. He would be filled with love for others. And that love would usurp his selfish love. See, God's love is perfect, isn't it? And when he imparts love into our lives, we can love like, like Jesus. Jacob would receive new character. You need a character overhaul. None of us would really admit that, by the way. We'd like just think we've got it all going on, we're all that in a bag of chips, but i got news for you. We all need to embrace change. Certain areas of our life are harsh, self-preserving. We do things in our own self-effort, and God wants us to grow up. I want to restate verse 28. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. That word overcome is listed over and over and over, and it has always to do with our first love, Jesus. Jesus, he's the overcomer. He's the one who causes us to be overcomers. He's the one that gives us the power, the grace, and the strength to do anything that he takes us to. What's God taking you to today? <clears throat> God's plan for each of our lives is that we would, you know, persevere. That we would overcome. And it means that we have to press through by faith to a place of surrender, no matter where we find ourselves. And some of us are dealing with physical issues. Some of us are dealing with emotional issues. Some of us are dealing with spiritual issues. Maybe you have doubts. You just don't like, eh, I don't know about this Jesus thing. It's okay. Press through. Keep going. Don't stop. Be an overcomer. I'm telling you several things. Jesus is your healer, both physically and emotionally. How he chooses to do that is a divine mystery, but he is our healer. All right? He's our comforter. He's our standby. He's a rock. He's everything that I have ever needed in my life. I could do anything that God sent me to, not in my own strength and not because Mary's just such a tenacious young woman, which of course is true, <laughs> but because I know my Redeemer. I know I've had a turning point where I realized that God, if God doesn't go with me, I don't want to go. And if God is with me, who could be against me? Amen? Amen? So whatever's coming against you today, Jesus is greater. Put your faith in Christ Jesus today. I wish God had a different way for us to gain our holy surrender than to wrestle us down. You've been wrestled down? 
Everybody has. Everybody has. All of his life, Jacob used carnal or human means to obtain spiritual blessing. He robbed. He robbed someone else's. And he's learned the futility of that act. God desires to bless his people. It is abundantly clear that it wasn't based on Jacob's behavior that God blessed him. It's just because God is God. He's awesome. He is loving. He's merciful. He's forgiving. He, you know, like we try to use our own mindset to decide why God does what he does. But you'll never figure it out. You will exhaust yourself. Why don't you just receive? He wants to bless you today with an abundance of spiritual blessings. It's always spiritual about God. The other stuff comes. The Bible tells us in Proverbs that, that God is the source of spiritual blessings, and he's the one that makes us rich. Now, I may not be financially rich, but I am rich in spiritual blessings. How about you today? Jacob thought that Esau was standing in his way of the blessing. And so he circumvent, right? Pushed him out of the way. He thought that Laban was in his way of spiritual blessing. Do you know who was in the way of his spiritual blessing? God. No, God was. God was saying, Jacob, your real beef and battle is with me. I'm going to wrestle you down because I am determined that your character is going to change. This is unbecoming to you, Jacob. I'm not going to let you go any further because if I cannot trust you with spiritual blessings until you get in agreement with me. Has God ever tried to just like slice some rough things off you? Some things that are unbecoming? God calls for our dependence and holy surrender. And that can only come through grace. And quite honestly, grace does sweetly break us. In the New Testament, Romans 9, 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul grieves over Israelites' resistance to grace provided by the Lord. Israel, the people of God, rejected Jesus, many of them. Many of them did not, but many of them did. They rejected love's turning point. And it grieved the heart of the Apostle Paul. It ought to grieve our heart all the time to pray for Israel, God's people. Romans 9, 1 through 5 reads, the Apostle Paul, I carry with me all the time a huge sorrow. It's an enormous pain deep within me, and I'm never free of it. I'm not exaggerating. Christ and the Holy Spirit are my witnesses. It's the Israelites. If there is any way I could be cursed by the Messiah so that they could be blessed by him, I'd do it in a minute. They're my family, and I grew up with them. They have had everything going for them. Family, glory, covenants, revelation, worship, promises, to say nothing of being the race that produced the Messiah, the Christ, who is God over everything always. The Apostle Paul knew that God loved Israel and wanted them to have a turning point. He still does. He still does. Truth. We need to pray for Israel every day. Are you doing that? You need to. If you know Jesus Christ, he, the Messiah, he has a heart. He's burdened. He's burdened. We need to stand for them as well. We need to stand and pray that they will wrestle with God and prevail in him. Trying to achieve the blessing in our own strength or by the ways of the world will never sacrifice or never suffice in our life. We will never be able to be really successful. But if we persist to be people who do not listen and are not going to allow the love of God to change us, then we will find a crimp in our own hips. We need to stop that. We need to stop it as a country too, by the way. That's all I'll say about that. Jacob has a problem with respecting or genuinely honoring God by caring for others as oneself. Just for the record, the reason this lesson is in God's word is because every one of us struggles in this area. We mistreat one another sometimes. We seek to gain the upper hand with one another. Um, our minds run to the worst scenario about what others do, whatever they say. We struggle to really identify how we even hurt them. And when it's all said and done, we justify exactly what we do. And it all takes place there. 
And it's sad because unless Jesus is allowed to renew the mind, we'll go unchanged. Invite the Spirit of God to touch you and renew your mind about how you treat people. It's an important word for us today. God wants us to know the truth. He wanted Jacob to know the truth, and he wants us to know the truth. You can't go on mistreating people and have the blessing of God. Jacob has been crippled and blessed by God now. This whole encounter and struggle with God is a blessing, even though it left him limping. The turning point uh, in the process of growing up, according to Max Lerner, is when you discover the core of strength within you that survives all hurt. And I'm telling you, the core of strength in every Christian is Christ. He's a personal savior. He gets down in the dust and the dirt of our lives to the, purchase, the purpose of blessing us. God the Father sent Jesus, his son, to wrestle sin and death, and he defeated them both at the cross. Jesus won the victory. Truth won. Jesus comes to wrestle with us, to develop our character, to call us to repentance, and to live as sons and daughters of, of integrity, of, of honor. Truth comes to lead the way to reveal what God desires. The cross is the turning point. It's love's turning point. The cross is where a holy God wrestles and wins. The cross is where we are invited to wrestle with a holy God, and he allows us to enjoy his victory. And from this point, the cross... God never lets us go. He never lets us go. He is faithful to see us into glory. Jesus died so that you and I might know the riches of his presence for all eternity. Jesus died so that we might enjoy the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus died so that we'd have the power to choose to walk away from sin and to live to glorify God. And Jesus died so that we might grow in our love and in our humility. Let's stand, all who are able, and sing our closing song, You Never Let Go. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. I will fear no evil, for my God is with Do you believe that? Yes. All right. Do you? Yes. Then no matter where God takes you this week, he is with you. He loves you. He will give you the grace to do whatever he takes you to. And your response needs to be praise. Thank you, God, that you are with me. Amen? Amen. It's about thanking God for loving you and having a relationship with you. He never leaves you. He'll never forsake you. You are never alone. That ought to set somebody free today. Amen. So you go, and God goes with you.